I am so pleased to bring this brother in Christ to you, a new friend of mine, Josh Edwards, who has such an interesting background because he's a musician who was part of the worship music band for Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And he also shared the stage with some false teachers, including Todd White. So we're going to talk about his firsthand experiences with those false teachers and why when they offered him to continue working for them, he said no, he he quit. He could not do this and how God led him out of the false teachings. We're, of course, describing these false teachings with grace and truth and love, um, just like I was shown grace when I was a false teacher. We want to show grace to these false teachers and pray for their repentance, pray for them to renounce the false teachings, and pray for them to spread the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to their audiences. So, Josh, thanks so much for being with me today. Absolutely. I am so glad to to be with you today. Wow, you've had quite the experience. A lot of these smooth talking prosperity gospel teachers, they hold a Bible, they quote scripture. If you haven't read the Bible yourself, you just don't know. And it's it makes you feel so good to hear their ego stroking messages, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. So let's just dive in. So let's talk about the time when you were working for, you were a paid employee for Kenneth Copeland Ministries. What was that like? As someone who spent a decade prior just working in my local Word of Faith church, um, it was surreal because I was now going to be sharing the stage with people that I saw on YouTube and heard all these great stories about and walking into something like that, it was, it was crazy. Uh, the first thought that I had was, wow, I am punching way above my weight class. Um, and, you know, some of the things that I saw while working for him, um, there are things that normal Christians, you know, who have sound theology would look at and be like, why, you know, what's, what's going on? Um, but is almost normative in, uh, in the word of faith in the charismatic circles. So you had come out of word of faith so that you didn't have like a litmus test to think that what Kenneth Copeland was teaching or Todd White was teaching was false doctrine. Not at all. Um, I grew up in the church of God denomination. So the charismatic um, theology or lack of theology that I had uh, that was very normal to me. Uh, I remember growing up, I wasn't sure why these people were speaking in a certain way or why they were running up and down the aisles. But uh, once I got set into the, the word of faith church in 2010, I just thought, wow, you know, okay, this must be normal. This was how my old church was. Mm -hmm. And I even remember thinking, why should I trust these people? And ultimately the reasoning that I came to was, They've been doing this longer than I have been in church. The church is doing well. And ultimately, my parents trust them. So I have mm -hmm. nothing to worry about. Got in the plane that God so graciously gave us. We're flying home. As I was going home, the Lord, real quickly, he said, Jesse, do you like your plane? Now, you know, I thought that's an odd statement. He gave, I said, well, certainly, Lord. He said, do you really like it? And I thought, well, yes, Lord. He said, then he said this. So that's it. I didn't know how to handle it. I went, what? He said, you're going to let your faith stagnate. And when he said that, that shocked me. I went, whoa, wait. I literally unbuckled my seatbelt, my plane. I stood up. My pilots looked right and said, do you need something? I said, no, no, I'm talking to God right now. And he, just, <laughs> and he went back to flying. I said, Lord, I don't think I was letting my faith stagnate. He said, so this is all I could ever do. I said, you want, you, you're trying to tell me something. He said, go to the book of Amos. So if you had the book of Amos, I want to read may, the scripture. May I right interrupt now. you there yes, for a second? Mm -hmm. You couldn't have done that on an airliner. No, sir. No way. Stand up and say, what'd you say, Lord? No. Okay. No. Yeah. And the guy sitting over there saying, what the hell does he think he's doing? <laughs> you can't do you that. You can't do that. No, no. That's why we're on that airplane. We can talk to oh, God. Glory we to can, God. We, it's true. We, it, it's, when I was flying for Oral Roberts, the uh, brother Deweese, my, my mm -hmm. boss on the airplane, he said, now, Kenneth, this is sanctuary. It protects the anointing on, on uh, uh, Brother, Brother Roberts. Roberts. And he said, you keep your mouth shut. Don't talk to him unless he talks. 
because when he's on a meeting, he doesn't talk to anybody but God. Now, Oral used to fly airlines, right. but it, even back mm -hmm. there then, man, mm -hmm. it, it got to the place where it was agitating his spirit, sure. people coming up to him. He right. had become famous and they wanted him to pray for him and right. all that. You, you can't. You, you can't manage that today. Right. The, this dope-filled world right. and get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right. That's exactly the And it, it's deadly. And, and it works on you hard. It really does. Sir, we'd just like to ask you about why you don't want to fly commercial. Why have you said that you won't fly commercial? You said that it's like getting into a tube with a bunch of demons. Why do you think well, that? No, no, listen to me just a second. Of course. Not the people. The main reason is because of the need. If, if I flew commercial, I'd have to stop 65% of what I'm doing. That's really the main. Isn't it true that you want to fly commercial so that you can fly in luxury? How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business, but... Isn't it the business of your donors? Listen, I paid. <laughs> you kind of caught me off guard here, okay. Well, let me, let me just ask you a really simple question. A lot of people think it's unbecoming for a preacher to live a life of luxury and to fly around in private jets. What's your response to that? Very simple. It takes a lot of money to do what we do. Do you ever use your private jets to go visit your vacation homes, for example? Yes, I do. Okay. Again, getting back to the comment. You said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Can you explain what you meant by that, yes. that, by that term then? Yes. Just, just explain, because it's really simple. You said you didn't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. What did you mean? The... Well, let me ask you. Do you think that let people that fly you. commercial are demons? If you give me a chance to talk, sweetheart, I'll explain this to you. But it's a biblical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It doesn't have anything to do with people. People, I love people. Jesus loves people. But people get pushed in alcohol. Do you think that's a good place for a preacher to be and prepare to go preach to a lot of people when somebody in there is dragging some woman down an aisle? It made me so mad to see that on television. I wanted to punch the guy out myself. I can't be doing that while I'm getting ready to preach. So you just don't like to be around the sinful people or the, the hurtful people. Is that what you're saying? Not the people, baby. Oh, boy. And was there any kind of Bible study going on in your home growing up? Or did the, the pastor read the Bible or have Bible study? Uh, so as far as Bible study in the home, there was very little. It was on different occasions. Um, now, of course, in the Word of Faith church um, there was a lot of scripture being thrown around but it was basically being used as a way to support what the person wanted to say rather than um, teaching about what the bible actually says so a lot of scripture twisting going on and and was there wild promises being made like if you sow a seed and you give money that god will definitely bless you with health and wealth Oh yeah. Yeah. That was an every week thing. Uh, you know, every service they of course, uh, would teach about why we should give, why we should tithe, you know, tithing is a big thing. Um, they would often use Malachi three as the justification for why we need to tithe, because if we don't, we'll be under a curse and God will take his protection off of us. Um, wow. we even had these things called Shunammite offerings. And this was essentially taken from the story about the woman at Shunem. Mm -hmm. And they took that to be a prescribed thing instead of a described thing. And they would even, uh, you know, take up special offerings under that ruse, um, promising people that they would get even bigger miracles and, um, you know, just tons of outlandish promises being made. 
I'm, I'm so sorry that you endured that. Praise the Lord for opening your eyes to the truth. Amen. And so, so from that church, then it was kind of a natural segue. And like you said, it was probably felt like an upgrade to be with a celebrity word of faith teacher, um, pastor. I don't want to call him pastor, <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> I mean, he, that's the trouble is they're famous and they seem to have kind of a charismatic personality. And like you said, your litmus test growing up was, well, the church is doing well. And Kenneth Copeland seems to be doing well in the new age. That's what people that I was touring with would say, look, I've got this big mansion in San Diego. So it, it shows that what I'm doing works. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there were many occasions where I would give money. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I emptied my bank account um, to try to make these deals with God and, you know, seeing, wow, it's working for everybody else, but it's not working for me. Something must be wrong with me. Yeah, it's sad it's, for sure. Yeah. And it can make people lose their faith, you know, because they are told that they get these promised blessings. And when you don't, you think, well, something's wrong. I don't have enough faith or this doesn't work or even worse, they might become atheists. At what point did you become a worship musician? So I have played music my entire life. My main instrument was drums and that's, mm -hmm. uh, I had played that since I was about two. Um, so growing up playing music, my dad was the drummer at our charismatic church or the church of God. I kind of followed in his footsteps. So, um, 2010, as soon as we joined the church, about a month after joining, uh, I was on the worship team and I uh, was playing pretty much every week, every service. Um, and then, you know, being super faithful there, you know, um, that is what eventually opened up the doors to work with not only Kenneth Copeland, but kind of the precursor to that was uh, Mark Barclay, who was another a uh, word of faith teacher in the same kind of vein. Um, you know, he's the same private jet and um, really fancy stuff. I mean, it's, um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, that all started just from being in a little church of, you know, 250 people. The only thing I actually did with him was Southwest Believers Convention 2019. I did okay. the youth portion of it. Okay. Um, Interestingly enough, the plan was for me to keep working with them. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of, uh, this kind of plays into 2020 and of course now, but um, I was supposed to do two conferences with, with them. There was going to be a West coast believers convention. And then I was supposed to do Southwest believers convention, 2020. God saved me, uh, as well as my brother and my wife out of the word of faith movement, uh, in early 2020. So we left wow. our previous church and severed all of our ties in March of 2020. Wow. So this is pretty recent. Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. Yeah. Okay. So while you were with Kenneth Copeland, um, did you share the stage with him? Was he on the stage with you when you were playing? I did. He was teaching. I did share the stage with him. Um, it was, it was interesting because, you know, at the time I was, I was like, wow, I'm so honored to be sharing the stage with this general, you know, as they refer to the, the elite in, in that movement, they refer to them as generals. Wow. And, and I was like, wow, I'm so honored to be sharing the stage with this general in the faith. Uh, and, uh, of course now looking back on it, it's like, you know, I'm glad that I was able to do that because now in sharing the story, God gets the glory ultimately. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, it, it was. Um, so as you're listening to him teach, you're there on stage with him. I mean, first of all, did, did he, was he friendly to the people on stage? Did he acknowledge y'all or talk to you? Or was it more like he was, in, you know, in a separate elite status? So most of the generals as they're referred to are basically untouchable. Um, I walked out a few minutes before we were about to get started. I was getting my, uh, my headphones and all my stuff on getting ready for the, the service to start. And uh, he was sitting on the front row next to where my, my keyboard was set up and uh, he had his bodyguard with him and everything. And I remember thinking, 
you know, wow, it would be really cool to go up and meet him. But from everything else that I was taught, it was like, you don't touch them. You don't talk to them, especially before a service, because they're trying to get their mind ready for God. And, you know, God might be speaking to them. A lot of these really crazy things looking back now. But um, yeah, he was basically untouchable. Okay. So that's what I've heard about some of these false teachers is they have the, the, they're insulated by their people. And if you're not in that circle of the A-listers, you don't even get to make eye contact with them. Yeah. I, I remember quite vividly wanting to go over and talk to him. And what I thought was at the time was God telling me, no, leave him alone. He's, he's, I'm working with him. Just leave him alone. Of course. Now I know that that's just my brain and my thoughts um, yeah. from what I was taught yep. in that. But uh, yeah, they're, they're very inaccessible to mm-hmm. uh, the average Joe, like, like me and anyone else there. Wow. Okay. So then you're, you're on stage listening to him teach. And at that time, your mind was very much on the word of faith movement. So what was your impression of what he was actually teaching at that point? I thought he was, you know, the closest thing to Jesus on earth. Um, you know, the, the things that he taught, I were like, wow, these are so profound and I've never heard anything like this, but that makes sense because he's a general. So he has this super close connection with God that none of us other people have. Uh, so he gets these divine revelations and, uh, he has the best knowledge of, of God because he's so close to him. So that's what people in the word of faith think about when you say the generals who, who are also considered generals in addition to Kenneth Copeland. So I'm speaking about people like Jesse Duplantis, um, Kenneth Copeland, of course, Kenneth Hagan would be referred to as one, um, Fred Price, um, Benny Hinn, of course, Todd White would, uh, would be considered one, I would say, um, Mark Barclay, who I also worked for, uh, he it was also considered one. I mean, there's and for a, Stephen Furtick too. Uh, I never referred. I never heard him referred to so much as a general, okay. Okay. Uh, but I, he is definitely as popular uh, for sure. Okay, so in the Word of Faith movement, you saw these these generals, who we now know are false teachers. You saw them as being uh, like demigods. Then, uh, yeah, I mean, it, there was this sense of they have the closest relationship to God, you know, why else would they have these national international ministries with private jets and, um, you know, fancy houses and wearing the fanciest clothes and things like that. Why else would, would they have these things unless God gave it to them uh, as a reward for, for being diligent? Wow. And no thought that, gosh, he's pressuring senior citizens on fixed incomes to give him money and he's squandering that money on himself and he's flaunting his wealth. There's no thought like that. At the time. No. Um, you know, as, as I said, there were a lot of times where I, I wondered why it wasn't working for me. Um, but one of the things that allowed me to hold on to those, uh, those teachings and things was, well, it's working for them. So it has to work. Um, you know, and it's, it's amazing now seeing how much of a real pyramid scheme it is, Mm -hmm. um, because what a lot of people don't know if you're outside of the word of faith movement is they prioritize having a pastor, um, as, as like a tiered thing. So, um, for me, I was at the very bottom of the totem pole, so I had to have a pastor and then my pastor had a pastor who he tithed to, and then it kept going up like that. Um, so ultimately only the guys at the top get rich and all of us who are emptying our bank accounts and not paying our bills are the ones left to suffer um, because we don't have you know, a ministry or, or things like that. Oh boy. I'm really sorry. That's just so sad. I'm glad we're exposing this as we're commanded to do. Uh, so you're listening to him teach and you, at that point you had drank the Kool-Aid of word of faith 
And so you were listening to him through that lens. And what did he do any so-called healings? I mean, did he do his Kenneth Copeland hocus pocus um, shtick, you know, where he's blowing away <laughs> like the, the weather magic that he did or so-called healing people? Uh, so none of the crazy outrageous things that we've seen over the past year or so um, there, of course, for every session that there that we had, there was an altar call. Um, and when we touch on Todd White, we'll get into some really crazy craziness. But okay. um, Kenneth Copeland, it was just kind of your standard lay hands on people. They'd fall over. A lot of them would squirm oh, wait, around. Wait, wait, and... wait, wait. That's not standard. Let's let's back up on that. OK, <laughs> OK, so. So Kenneth Copeland, he was doing like Benny Hinn did, where he would put his hands on people and they'd fall over. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Yeah, that's him going through you right now. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Glory to God. You're not bound to this chair. The day will come, you'll walk out of it. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Now then, you guys, just help him up. Help him up. Power of God's all over him. He's not hurt. He's not hurt. Praise the God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord God. Praise the Lord God. Praise the Lord God. Oh, I like the color of that mask there. <laughs> you knew I'd like that one, didn't you? It's what's called being slain in the spirit. It's essentially this kind of euphoric state where you can't hold yourself up anymore. You, uh, you literally just fall over. Um, and you, the first time that it ever happened to me, um, I was kind of psyching myself up because I was like, wow, I really want this to happen and, and things like that. And it's almost like a hypnosis um, where somebody is conditioned by um, the music for one. Uh, mm -hmm. The music is a vital part of what happens uh, in the word of faith, as well as just any charismatic uh, emotionalistic services. Um but you know the the music is is just right. Is it um, is it just as a musician? Is it hypnotic music? I mean, you played keyboards too. In the mm -hmm. new age, there would be this kind of monotone synth synthesized um, tr trance inducing music. Was it like that? Very much so. Okay. Um, we often in our rehearsals, we would often practice. Uh, what we're going to feel to the audience like a spontaneous moment. Uh, we would often practice those things so that when we eventually got to that point, we had all of these spontaneous things rehearsed and we could essentially by even the chords that we played or the sounds that we used um, essentially make people do whatever we wanted them to do. I would create these really ethereal uh, ambient kind of sounds because it would help people to disengage their mind from whatever was happening, um, ultimately to become more susceptible to whatever antics were about to happen. Mm. I'm sure you've repented for that. Oh yeah. Wow. And then you've, you've got these pictures and the video clips of uh, the kind of the light show that would go with the music. And it reminds me of um, like a concert, like a rock mm. concert. And so was that also part of, the manipulating the mood to have these different lights and things? Very much so. So um, I actually currently work in event production. So okay. uh, lighting and sound is, is what I do um, as kind of a side job. Right. But um, yeah, so I remember talking to one of the leaders in, uh, in Mark Barclay Ministries whenever we were uh, working on a youth conference. Uh, about the lighting and the the pyrotechnics and lasers and fog machines and all this kind of stuff and the the justification for that was well we're trying to we're trying to meet kids where they are so if it's very much a um 
conforming to the world yep. to mm-hmm. try to draw people in. But ultimately, we know that if you're going to draw carnal people in with worldly things, you ultimately have to keep doing those worldly things to mm-hmm. retain their attention. That's right. You have um, to feed the goats. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that answers that question. And this is really fascinating, Josh. I really appreciate you giving us this inside scoop because um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm a former musician myself and I was caught up in the rock and roll world before I was saved. And, uh, and I know how much music affects us. And as a Christian, I'm really concerned about the top 40 worship music with these unbiblical lyrics. It just seems like the devil's using music to pry open people's hearts and minds and plant them with bad theology. Yeah, I mean, other than these songs that um, are basically worshiping ourselves, like many of the, uh, the, the music coming out of Elevation, Bethel, whatever, um, there were even some songs that were not even in like a covert way, but um, were singing songs to the devil. Um, what? Yeah. So there, there's a yeah. Hillsong song uh, that the chorus says, let the devil know not today, you know, basically singing to the devil that he can't have us and um you know, he's lost and and things like that. Um, Among other ones, there there are some more, there are some more recent ones that I've heard. That's Um, dangerous. Very much so. Yeah. Don't talk to the devil. (laughs) He's, he's way smarter than we are. And uh, let, you know, call on Jesus, pray on, pray for Jesus and put on your armor of God in Ephesians six, when dealing with spiritual warfare. Um, pray the Lord's prayer, but don't sit there and talk to the devil. That's craziness. It's dangerous. Right. Okay. So, so you're, you're, you're doing the, the light show and the trance inducing music and Kenneth Copeland's on stage and you have no reason to think that there's anything wrong. You're probably just having the time of your life at that point with him thinking that God's blessing you. Right. And that, gosh, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. I'm just can imagine what it must've been like for you. And then Todd White comes out. And then what was that like? So he is extremely charismatic, um, very loud. Um, and, and he puts off this persona that he's, you know, very loving and approachable. And, um, you know, he will often kind of reuse a lot of the same tricks, um, you know, one of his big claims to fame is, of course, the leg lengthening, which he did not do while while he was around me. Um, at least I don't remember. There's, it's possible he could have done something backstage, which wouldn't wouldn't surprise me. But um, you know, it was a lot of a lot of yelling, a lot of um, you know, you need to get up to the altar, you need to do this and that. Um, and then one of the things that he does as well, which is where I really played into this, is it's kind of known for him, if he's up preaching, he always wants a keyboard player playing behind him. Yeah, I've noticed um, that. And it's that new age hypnotic synthesized music. Yeah, he he wants a very kind of aerial, uh, atmospheric sort of thing um, to again, kind of to, to focus people's minds in on what he was saying. And um, of course, to get them ready for all of the, the crazy things that were going to happen later in the service. And so this was a real conscious decision on everyone's part to, because every time I see a video of Todd White, he's got this crazy new age music behind him. And it, I, so, but it's done purposefully to get people out of their minds, would you say, to get them out of their, their rational thinking? I would definitely say so. Um, you know, as, as a church musician at that, you know, at that time, um, I would work on ways, um, you know, unknowingly, I thought I was working on how to increase my anointing or how to, you know, have this more anointed music, but, um, I ultimately was working to make the music so seamless and um, emotionally 
kind of grasping that, um, you know, things would happen, you know, kind of going back to like being slain in the spirit or, you know, people convulsing, which will, would happen quite a bit too, when they get touched. Um, you know, it, a lot of it really does have to do with, with the music. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is so interesting, Josh. Gosh, thank you. And so when you're listening to Todd White up there and his yelling and, and such, I mean, was it the same thing with that you, that same reaction you had to Kenneth Copeland, where this is a, a word of faith general and who can do no wrong in your mind and you were in awe of him? Was it like that? Uh, to some extent. So I was less familiar with Todd White uh, mm-hmm. whenever I was working there. Um, after, after the service was over that night, I, I went back to my hotel room and was looking up a lot of his stuff and seeing a lot of the leg lengthening and you know, these pseudo miracles come the next morning because uh, he did the night session. And then the very next morning, um, he did those back to back. And uh, that next morning, I was definitely like, wow, this guy's the real deal. I mean, look, he's lengthening people's legs and people are getting healed because of this. And uh, I mean, it's it was unlike some other things that I had I had seen. <laughs> What would you have done or how would you have reacted if you saw one of the many discernment ministry videos dis- disputing that Todd White is authentic? You know, for instance, the leg lengthening bit, you know, mm-hmm. th- that's been kind of a, a carnival trick for, for decades before yeah. any faith healers got into it. Um, and ultimately, these these claims of healing and these claims of miracles and things like that, uh, there's not a paper trail to be left. So there's no way to authenticate these healings. There's no way to follow up, you know, the next day or weeks Mm -hmm. later or things like that to, to validate that what happened was genuine uh, because most of these things are simply um, psychosomatic healings for for lack of a better term you know adrenaline pumps up and yeah. uh, the power of suggestion is uh is a very powerful tool mm-hmm. uh, again going back to the the hypnosis kind of thing if you can convince somebody that they're not hurting or they're not sick um you know the brain is powerful enough that it will um it'll block those those pain uh the pain senses and things like that and it'll make people think that they were genuinely healed when in reality, they're no better now than they were before. That's true. And Justin Peters, I'm sure you're familiar with his work. He told me uh, he's done so much research on word of faith, false healings, that he thinks there's a demonic spiritual warfare element to this, that the demons actually can create the experience of illness or injury and then lead a person to a false healer and then seem to heal the person by the demons stop their oppression. And then that person is convinced that the false teacher is for real and sticks with them. And, and so I think that's true with the religion I was raised in Christian science, which seems to have a lot of healings. I think it's just a way that the demons hook people in. 
Uh, same with new age. There's people who seem like they got healed with shamans and, and Reiki and all these, you know, new age, just wild types of healings. And, and it's all very much planned behind the scenes by the demonic realm. Yeah. And it's, you know, with, with you coming out of Christian science and the new age, it's amazing how much overlap there is. Yes. Um, you know, as uh, Justin Peters, Clouds Without Water was one mm -hmm. of the many things that uh, started to put cracks in the dam for me. How did you even find Justin? I mean, I know it was a, it was God, of course. Right. So, so God put Justin Peters in front of you, but I mean, that's, that's like 180 degrees off of your mindset at that point. So, yeah. Uh, so interestingly enough, um, the first video that I saw with him and it was also, uh, Todd Friel was, um, why we shouldn't play, uh, Bethel elevation Hillsong music in the church. Uh, interestingly enough, after, after watching your video about it, uh, from, uh, I, I forget the pastor's name, but okay, David. Uh, so you saw David Henneke's video from 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 Houston. Yes. So, so and I'll, I'll put a link to all these videos in the mm -hmm. description. So you first saw that video from the the pastor in Texas who quit playing Bethel music in his church, and yes. and that's that's a very intense video. I mean, he doesn't hold back at all. He goes after all the false teachings. Yeah, it's kind of shocking video. And so you watched that. And then right after that, you saw Todd Priel with Justin Peters talking about. Yep. And so these are these are songs you play for a living. That must have been shocking for you. Yeah, I mean, it was that was a battle that I wrestled with for a long time. Um, and whenever I was kind of dealing with that, I had asked the main worship leader that I worked with for Mark Barclay Ministries, and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm finding out that these movements have bad theology and um, there's a lot of things that I don't agree with. Can I still play their music? And, you know, of course he told me, yeah, don't worry about it. If the song's good, you're all right. And I initially accepted that. Um, but the more that I was reading scripture and the more that, that I just thought about it, um, my conviction changed. I was like, I cannot, regardless of if I'm in the word of faith or, or not, because at that time I still was, um, you know, I cannot in good conscience put these heretical ministries up on display, you know, giving them my stamp of approval by playing their, their music. Um, but yeah, wow. so I mean, that's, uh, that's amazing. Praise the Lord. I mean, yeah. that's, that's God that's God taking the veil down and, and the mm -hmm. scales off your eyes. Wow. So um, as you're going through this, your wife is all in of the word of faith. Were you talking with her? Was she getting also called out of word of faith? So this, here's a testament to how amazing God is and how he worked this situation out. Um, my wife, when we first met, uh, we first started dating and things like that. Um, she was a Jehovah's witness. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, throughout the course of a few years, I was trying to convert her. She was trying to convert me. Um, ultimately, when I was out of town doing uh, the Kenneth Copeland conference, um, I was kind of distancing myself from her because I felt the Lord telling me that I needed to break up with her because she was a, a Jehovah's Witness. Mm. So I come back. You know, I, I told her, I'm like, Hey, look, this is, it is what it is. I'm sorry. Um, and then right then and there, she was like, I know you're right. Uh, you know, of course we were both were wrong at that point, but, yep. uh, she's like, you know, I've just been trying to keep a blind eye to the, the truth. And so she jumped right in to word of faith. She was going to the same church I was at, um, you know, we, we were still separated at that time, but, um, you know, ultimately we ended up getting back together. And then as God started to take the, the blinders off my eyes, um, after we left, um, we got married, um, in May of 2020. And shortly after that, 
the gospel became real to her as well. And mm. uh, I, I was driving uh, for a delivery company and I get a text from her as I'm sitting outside the warehouse, getting ready to pick up my, my work for the day. Uh, you know, and she, she says, um, you know, I, I've been praying a lot and today I just broke down in tears, you know, because of my sin and understanding the true gospel. And um, at that time we were going to a, uh, a great reformed Baptist church, uh, reformed Baptist church of Elizabethtown, uh, Kentucky and uh, pastors, uh, Josh White and James Clark lovely brothers. Uh, I miss them dearly. Um, but you know, just with all of that, um, you know, God opened her eyes to the Mm -hmm. truth of the gospel as well. And, um, you know, so she, uh, we went through the membership process of our church and we got truly baptized. Um, and it's, it's just amazing how, how God is, has worked all of this out, Uh, but yeah, she, amazing. Yeah, but she jumped headfirst into it. Um, oh, good. Um, you know, and, and in the word of faith, she she sank, you know, a few thousand dollars just over the course of a year that we were in it together. Wow. Um, you know, trying to tell God, hey, if you'll do this for me, I'll give this or, you know, trying to make these deals with, with God. Mm. Oh my goodness. What a story. That's like Michael and I, he got saved out of the new age at the same time as I did. And Praise the Lord for helping us that way, because that's really difficult to be on the equally yoked. So Mm -hmm. praise the Lord. How did you, how did you come across the David Henneke video? Did, were you actually researching this? Had God put this somehow in your mind or your heart that something's wrong here? Something's off. So I think interestingly enough, um, I was looking through uh, some, some things on YouTube and the Bethel glory cloud video popped up in my recommended. And I think that was one of the videos that was, Hey, if you liked this, you'll like this. Um, and so through, through that, um, listening to that. And, um, of course the Justin Peters, uh, Todd Friel video and and things like that, it was, just like one thing after another. Yeah. Once you get came up. Right. Exactly. That's how it was for me with um, fighting for the faith. Chris Rosebro's video yes, on, yeah. on uh, Joyce Meyer. But I think it started with me having the thought, is she, is she for real? I mean, I don't want to be fooled again after coming out of the new right. age. And, and so I think I actually did research and then he just kind of leveled her <laughs> to me because yeah, I had yeah. been pay- sending her money and I was hook, line and sinker into her ministry. I was watching her every single day. I'm just so grateful for discernment ministries because uh, these are very brave men and women who tell the truth, hopefully with grace and in love. Um, and we've got to pay attention to this and be pointed back to our Bibles. Like Acts 17 says that the Bereans, they, they compared everything that was it Paul and Silas were speaking and compared it all to scripture. Does, does the Bible actually say this? And if it does, then, you know, we're theologically safe as long as they're not twisting it. And, and so that's why um, it's so important to read your Bible every day, to pray for discernment, to pray for the Holy spirit, to reveal the truth about the Bible to you. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting. You bring up the, the Bereans because one of the other big things in the word of faith is if you start to dig into scripture too much, you'll become too smart and you'll ultimately leave the word of faith movement. Um, You know, so, so they would tell you, you know, that, that the, the, the super smart people that, that really, dive in and nitpick everything, you know, they're the ones that ultimately leave because they don't believe in the power of the Holy spirit and all all these other, you know, crazy things. I've heard that they think their, their churches are spiritually dead and and Mm -hmm. such. And yeah, Uh, there's a lot of defenses to keep people into deception. There was even uh, somebody who made a statement that uh, they claimed that it was a prophecy that God said that he was going to personally visit every single church and any churches that locked him out, you know, 
that's that's a pretty normative uh phrase to to lock god in the back room or to put god in a box or whatever they you know he claimed that god said that any churches that locked god out of the out of the church or that put god in a box he would never visit them again or so your eyes were opened um you know a lot of people would watch a todd priel video and say ah you know it's just him and but but your heart was opened by god i mean that's pure god's work on your heart so this again this all kind of comes together um my brother uh, about the time that I was in Texas working for Kenneth Copeland, um, my brother started to kind of go through the same process that I did. Um, I, I remember coming home to him and being like, wow, Todd White preached his great message about how we're not guilty for our sins and all this other stuff. And and my brother just point blank looks at me. He's like, you know, he's a false teacher, right? And I'm like, but, but but no, no, here, here's what he talked about and, and all this other stuff. And so to kind of condense everything, my brother got saved. He was praying for a way out because, you know, he was at the same church. I was, he was just as busy as I was, um, you know, in different areas. And he was praying for, you know, not only for, for the family, for our family, but he was praying for a way to be able to leave and not be alone in the situation. And then it's, it's, I I cannot grasp this because it's, you know, just how amazing God is, but because of that, God saved me. God saved my wife. We all left together. And um, I mean, it's, that is truly the goodness of God and, and his grace and his mercy um, to use the prayers of my brother um, to not only, you know, God saving him, but for those prayers to be used in a way that um, two other souls would be saved as well. Praise the Lord. And I can relate to your story so much, Josh, because the same thing happened with my brother, Ken, who was saved out of Christian science and new age. 20 years before me and prayed for us, prayed for me and Michael, just never gave up. And, um, and so same thing with you and your wife, Michael and I were saved. And we really credit Ken's prayers for a lot of that. Let's back up for a minute and talk about Todd White teaching about sinless perfection. For those of you who are uh, familiar with, with Todd White's teachings, or you've seen a lot of his, um, his things, he very much teaches a sinless perfection kind of thing. Um, he has claimed on multiple occasions that he's never violated his conscience, that he's never uh, violated the word of God after being saved. He came and gave me this blank canvas. He came and gave me this pure heart and I've never violated it with anything. Because I love Jesus. My hands are clean. My heart is pure. I love him with all my heart. I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, well done. What's he going to say when you stand before him? You can actually have the word so strong inside of your heart that you never have to slip. People are like, well, that's false. That's not true. Well, you're wrong. I live with me. So for 13 years, I've been free from that. I've wow. never looked lustily with lust at a woman, ever. I live with me. My kids will tell you that I'm a man of God. I'm a father. Because God doesn't say he wants you 97% pure. I mean, was Jesus 97% pure? Um, and this isn't just a Todd White thing. There are a lot of, a lot of people who are very arrogant about, well, after I got saved, I, I never had a foot in the world and a foot in the church. I'm never going to, you know, um, but yeah, Todd White was very much a, uh, a sinless perfection, you know, if, and, and to a point, all word of faith is like that. They teach Mm -hmm. that if you continually sin, you can lose your salvation. Um, they taught that some people would only make it into heaven by the skin of their teeth. Um, that, you know, some, the generals would be welcomed in open arms with a crowd there. And some people would just crawl in out of the gutter into heaven, like really outrageous claims. Uh, 
What do they do with Apostle John in scripture saying that if you say you're without sin, you are a liar? So interestingly enough, that was not a scripture we heard a whole lot, um, along with many other scriptures. Um, But yeah, I mean, the way that I would have looked at it back then was, I know that I sin, but if my not sinning outweighs my sinning, then I'm all right. It's it's a very Catholic way of, yeah, of looking say, at it. Very works-based. Okay, you mm-hmm. earn your way into heaven then. Well, so interestingly enough, they won't say that you earn your way into heaven, you know, because they'll say you cannot earn your salvation, but you sure better be working a lot after you have it to keep it. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it's very much a works-based, uh, a works-based gospel. And, wow. you know, it's uh, it's crazy. So Josh, I've really enjoyed this and I've learned so much from you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before you leave today? Um, ultimately, I just want to share the gospel. Um, you know, there, I, I never take any opportunity for granted, you know, to assume that anyone who's listening has heard the gospel. Um, I know when I was in the word of faith movement, I didn't hear it a whole lot. And even when I left, uh, my brother and I, we met with our previous pastor and we said, look, we're not hearing the gospel. And instead of it being a heartbreaking reality for him, you know, he got defensive and well, if they're not hearing the gospel, why have I grown the church and and all these things? So ultimately the gospel boils down to this. We have all sinned against a thrice holy, thrice righteous God. And for him to be righteous and just, he must punish the lawbreakers, um, you know, just as in any natural courtroom, if you break the law, there's some sort of a fine. However, our natural justice system is flawed in you can kind of squirm your way out of the punishment you deserve in a lot of cases. And because God is perfectly just, perfectly righteous, he must punish to the same degree that he is righteous and that he is holy. Um, So ultimately God requires perfection. And because none of us, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. None of us could ever pay for that debt that we have accrued against God. So God now, and, 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 and this is, this is the greatest news because this, the gospel of Jesus was not a plan B for God. God knew what was going to happen. He foreordained it that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, came to earth, fully God, fully man, lived the perfect life that we could not live, uh, fulfilled the entire law, um, and then at the end of it was wrongly beaten, put in prison whipped, scorned, spit upon, and killed to satisfy God's wrath. God placed the entirety of his wrath upon Jesus while he hung on the cross. So that in that, because Jesus paid the fine that we so deserve to pay, now he can rightly and justly save us and say, you are free, your fine has been paid, repent, believe and walk. Um, so I encourage you if, if this is not the gospel that you're hearing at your church, um, you know, there are many people who, uh, who this is their reality. The, the, the gospel that they hear is God wants you to be healthy and wealthy, and God's going to fix all your broken issues and, and things like that. But the gospel, the the, the true gospel is that we are sinners who cannot save ourselves. We cannot keep ourselves saved. We cannot earn our salvation in the beginning or anything like that. But Jesus has come to pay the fine that we so deserve to pay, to take the punishment that we so deserve to endure so that ultimately God can rightly and justly call us free to go. And thank you, God, for your grace and mercy and saving wretched sinners like us. 
when we didn't deserve it. Thank you, Josh, so much for your time. Thank you also for your wife and, and uh, being able to share her testimony through yours. And we just thank you. Can people get a hold of you? Uh, yeah. So um, I'm easily uh, reachable on Facebook, facebook.com slash Joshua Edwards, I, I um, Instagram is the same way though. I'm not very active on there, but if you message me, I'm I'll, I'll get it uh, at Joshua Edwards, I, I, um, and, you know, if anyone has questions or uh, needs somebody to talk to, or has, you know, maybe that you have family or friends that are in this movement and, and you just need some reassurance that God can save them and, um, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm always more than willing to, uh, to talk and to help people through. That's very generous of you. And we'll have the links to Josh's social media below. Thank you again for your time, Josh. We really appreciate you. Absolutely. It's been fun.